Bibles to uh, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 1 through 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 1 through 8. And here we learn about, again, we've been singing about it. Now we'll read about it. Our real home is in heaven. Uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's everybody turn over there and uh, be a blessing just to read the Word of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 1 through 8. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, be murdered, not for that we would not be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath brought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. If we are confident, I say, and willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday we're dealing with the subject of death and what the Bible teaches about death. Now this morning I want to just introduce the subject of heaven because there's a lot of uh, Bible teaching about heaven and we'll just scratch the surface this morning and just introduce it because there's so much glorious teaching in the Bible about heaven, the Bible doctrine of uh, uh, heaven. Now, First of all, the Bible is very, very clear that uh, heaven is a place. See, it's a literal place as we read the Word of God. It's not a state, it's not a dream, uh, a condition, but the Bible teaches that heaven is a uh, definite uh, place. Now, uh, I'm sure most everyone has heard the verse in John 14, uh, 2, and in John chapter 14 and verse 2, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. See, in other words, heaven is a place, just as a uh, literal uh, place as we're here this morning. So we say heaven is a real place, and that's on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, what the Lord Jesus Christ said, I go to prepare a place uh, for you. Now, as we study the Word of God, the Bible is very, very clear that only saved people go to heaven. Say, only saved people go uh, to heaven. We uh, read this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. Say, uh, Paul writing there to believers in the city of Corinth, and he says there, you see, uh, to be absent from the body, that's physical death, when a, a believer dies, is to be present with the Lord. Now, that's a tremendous verse in the Bible. To be absent from the body, when someone dies, the Bible says they are present with uh, the Lord. Turn in your Bible to uh, Philippians chapter 1. Now, in Philippians chapter 1, we have, again, these uh, familiar verses about heaven. It says in Philippians chapter 1, and uh, verse 21 uh, through 23. For to me to live is Christ. And he says, see, to die is gain. Now imagine that. See, it's a gain to die. It's beneficial to die. Why? That's what the Bible says. See, Paul in Philippians 1.21. For to me to live is Christ. To die is actual uh, gain. Now the Bible goes on and says, for if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet I shall choose, I know not what. And um, for I am in a strait betwixt two. See, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, 
which is far better. Now, see, and he says to depart, in other words, he's talking there about death, and Paul is saying, if I die, you see, very uh, uh, interesting here and very important, he says uh, to be with Christ. Say, to be with Christ. Now, that's very important as we study and read uh, the Word of God. Say, I believe the best definition of heaven in the Bible, and as time goes on, we'll uh, study about uh, many or different wonderful passages about heaven in the Bible, but always keep in mind the best definition of heaven is to be with Christ. Say, that is heaven, to be with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he says in the next verse, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for uh, you. But you see what Paul said there in the Word of God, uh, to be with Christ. In other words, when I die, if I die, I will go to be with Jesus Christ. Imagine that. Say, with Christ, I will be. That is heaven, according to uh, to uh, the Word of God. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17, uh, Paul is talking there about the future, and he says, if we are living when Christ comes again, uh, he says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. In other words, eternally, everlastingly, we shall be with the Lord. Now, that is... Uh, what heaven is all about. See, uh, to be absent from the body, present with the Lord. See, uh, Paul said, if I died, I would go to be with the Lord. Very wonderful uh, teaching in the Word of God. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, so shall we ever be with the Lord. See, ever be with the Lord. All of our deceased loved ones are with uh, the Lord. So, according to the Bible, it is a place where only saved people go. That's very clearly taught in the Word of God. Say, uh, only those who are saved go uh, to heaven. And then uh, uh, the Bible teaches that heaven is a place where believers will be rewarded. Now, over and over again as we study the Bible, the Bible does not teach that our rewards are down here. The Bible says that through much tribulation, you shall enter the kingdom of, uh, uh, of God. But now, you see, for instance, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12, Jesus is talking there in the context, by the way, it's one of the Beatitudes, as you read about the Beatitudes there in Matthew chapter 5, and the interesting thing, thing there is that he's talking to his children about those who will be persecuted down here. Uh, you see, blessed are those people that are reviled and persecuted down here. But in Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 12, he says, Great is your reward in heaven. Not down here upon earth, but see, great is your reward. So that means that we should never be afraid uh, to speak up for the Lord, never be afraid to be a testimony, because great is your reward in heaven. Even if people revile you, even if there's a price to pay, say, great is your reward, but he said, in heaven. In other words, your reward will be in uh, uh, heaven. And then uh, uh, it's a place, according to the Bible, where we should be laying up treasure. Isn't that interesting as you study the Bible? For instance, the Bible says in um, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20, Jesus said, lay up treasure in heaven. Someone might say, well, pastor, I'm living here upon this earth. Yes, and Jesus said, as you are living here upon earth, you need to lay up treasures in heaven. See, that's the way you ought to live as a child of God. Now, see, what's he talking about there? And in the context, see, he's talking about money. That's exactly what he's talking about. And he's saying you ought to use your money for the glory of God. You ought to use your money to honor God in your life. Now, uh, and this is a reward 
in heaven, see, uh, uh, lay up treasures in heaven that everybody can lay up in heaven. The poorest person in the world, the richest person in the world, no matter who a person is, they can actually lay up treasures in heaven. I believe another way of talking about the matter of rewards in heaven. And you see, uh, the way we uh, get that reward in heaven, lay up treasures in heaven, is by our giving down here. See, how we support the Lord's work on this planet. How we uh, support the kingdom of God right here. Now, in that uh, passage, that's where Jesus said, say, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And he says, lay up treasures in heaven because ultimately all of your silver, gold, expensive things, all of your money someday is going to uh, just dissipate uh, and then uh, go away. And it'll rot. It'll, it'll come to uh, nothing. So that's interesting. Say about heaven, say how practical the subject of heaven is. Now, a lot of times someone says, well, you preach about heaven and it's not talking about our everyday lives. Yes, it is. The Bible says that your reward as a child of God is not down here, but it's in heaven. And then number two, Jesus said you ought to be laying up treasures in heaven. You ought to live in such a way that you're laying up treasures in heaven. And he's talking there about our money. You say, Pastor, well, how do I do that? By at least beginning by giving a tithe to the local church. That's how you begin to lay up treasure in heaven. And if you're not at least giving a tithe to the local church, you are not laying up treasure in heaven. Read the passage. He's talking about money. That's how you get treasure in heaven, you see. And uh, that's the beginning point. You see, in other words, see, we can use our money for the glory of God down here. And when we do, Jesus said, I'll reward you up there in heaven for the way you give uh, down here upon earth. Much could be said about that. So you see, heaven is a very practical subject as you study the Word of God. Our reward is in heaven. We should lay up treasures uh, in heaven. Heaven is a place where people go when they die, according to the Word of God. And Jesus himself said, say, I am going to prepare a place for you. Now, it's literal. It's a literal place that Jesus Christ is preparing. We sang about it um, uh, this morning. But now, see, and we're just introducing the subject because there's a lot in the Bible about the subject of heaven. But another thing that we want to point out is that, you see, uh, heaven is a restricted place. Now, uh, everybody has heard at one time or another, people say, well, everybody goes to heaven when they die. Everybody's heard that at one time or another. Or, uh, you know, at a, at a funeral service, here is our deceased brother and we're sure he's in heaven. Well, the Bible teaches that heaven is a restricted place. Now, again, the Bible teaches that only saved people go to heaven. That's clearly taught in the Bible. Now, for instance, there are several lists in the Bible. And it's very interesting when you study these lists. Now, for instance, we have one of them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 9 and 10. And there Paul is writing to the church at uh, Corinth. And uh, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And he goes on and he says, be not deceived. In other words, what is Paul saying? Not everybody is going to go to heaven. Don't be uh, deceived in relation uh, to that matter. And then he goes on and he lists 10 classes of people, 10 types of people. And he mentions them specifically who shall not enter the kingdom of uh, God. So um, we'll not go through the entire list, but uh, he mentions 10 types of people there. Number one, the first class of, pe of people that he mentions, you can read it there in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, are, and this is what Paul says there, fornicators. So he says, no. Now what he's talking about uh, uh, are people who have persisted 
in their sin. He's not talking about um, somebody who did it and is forgiven of their sin. Now, he's talking about people who continue in this sin. They don't see anything wrong with it, and uh, they don't realize that it's a sin against God. So the first class of people that he mentions are fornicators. Now, what that is, is sex before marriage is a, uh, the sin of fornication. And the Bible says no fornicator will ever go to heaven. Then he mentions uh, idolaters and adulterers. And then the last um, sin that he mentions here in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 are extortioners. Now, the word extortioners there is uh, somebody that simply means uh, somebody that is bloodthirsty for money, somebody who cheats people out of money, someone who uh, is a crook. They are unethical when it comes to money. Now, the extortioners, the word extortioners here, and the background of that word is very, very uh, powerful because what it uh, is talking about is bloodthirsty wolves. That's uh, the word. In fact, uh, when Jesus said, uh, talks about wolves, bloodthirsty wolves, that's the same word, believe it or not, in the Bible. See, an extortioner, and what does that mean? See, their whole life, their God is money, and they will do anything to get money. That's why everybody here this morning, at one time or another, people have cheated us out of money in one way or another. Maybe it was a, a false contract or the fine print, or you went to buy something and uh, you didn't realize that they had these tack-ons where, where they added on, might have been a financial advisor, might have been a car dealer, and that's why a lot of times um, in our society, it's colloquial, uh, it's hard to find an honest used car dealer. Now, why? Or hard to find an honest uh, mechanic in our society. A lot of people say that. Or it's hard to find an honest lawyer in our society. Why? Because, see, a lot of people are greedy for money, and they will do anything to get money, to suck money out of somebody else, and to cheat somebody, and to be unethical in relation to money. So see how practical the Bible is. See, there's a lot of people like that in our society. See, they, they are totally unethical. By the way, there are some corporations and businesses in America that are built upon the principle of cheating you out of your hard-earned money. And that is their bottom line. Say anything, do anything to get money from that customer and to cheat that customer. And some corporations, that's their bottom line. See, they're, uh, again, the word talks about a bloodthirsty wolf. And uh, as you know about the wolf, say if the wolf attacks you, there's only one part of the body that the wolf goes after, and that is your throat. And when the wolf attacks you, bites you in the throat, you are dead. So that's what it's talking about. See, there are a lot of dishonest people in society. And everybody here knows about that uh, very clearly. Now, see, those people, the Bible says, will not go to heaven. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the first uh, person he mentions is the matter of a fornicator. And the last person he mentions is the matter of an extortioner. He mentions about 10 different people here. But by the way, turn over there to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 6, because what we read here is a very powerful uh, uh, thing in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6. Now, uh, you say, well, pastor, that's pretty strong uh, language, and it is, but now, you see, what he's talking about is the church at Corinth. Now, he said that uh, you live in a decadent society uh, characterized by these 10 characteristics of people that you read about in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate abusers themselves with mankind, that's homosexuals. And then, but he says here in uh, verse 11, and such were some of you. In other words, some of you used to be homosexuals. 
Used to be fornicators, used to be adulterers, used to be idolaters, used to cheat everybody out of money. Uh, money was your God and you were greedy, but you see, praise God for the gospel, verse 11, and such were some of you. That's the way you used to live. See, before you got saved, before you came to know the Lord. See, in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11, but ye are washed. Isn't that beautiful? See, you're washed from all that filthy sin. It was dirty. It was filthy. But praise God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, you were washed from your sin. You see, and then he goes on and he says, uh, uh, you are washed and you're sanctified. Now you're set apart. That word sanctify here, sanctified here, it means you're set apart now to live a godly life. Before you were saved, you lived an ungodly life. Now you are saved, you are living a godly life. And then the next word he, he mentions here is a matter of justified. Say so you're justified in the sight of God. God looks upon you as if you have never, ever sinned, as if you've never committed one sin. Say that's the gospel. That's the glorious news of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, say, and what he's talking about, say, that's the way some of you used to live. And uh, he said, there's a lot of people still living in the city of Corinth that live that way and they will not inherit the kingdom of God because they were not saved. But praise God, someone might say, well, my life was characterized by a lot of deep sin, a lot of filthy sin, a lot of sin that I'm ashamed of. But you see, the blood of Christ can cleanse you of all of your sin. When you come to Christ, He washes you. He makes you clean in the sight of God Almighty. Now, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 21, see, there's another list of people where the Bible says they will not go to heaven. Now, um, again, it's not talking about people who have done these things and then they repented and then they got saved, but it's talking about people who continue in these things. See, heaven is a restricted place. Only saved people go uh, to heaven. Now, in Galatians 5.21, he says, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, and then he lists 17 different individuals who will not go to heaven. See, does the Bible teach everybody's going to go to heaven? Absolutely not. Now, in Galatians 5, 21, uh, there, he's talking about 17 different classes of people who will never go uh, to heaven. Now, he begins there with the word adulterers. Now, we all know what an adulterer is. That's a married person who has uh, sex outside of the bonds of marriage. See, that's a sin against God, and that indicates that that person who continues in that sin uh, will not go to heaven. And that means Bill Gates, that means uh, Bill Clinton, that means a lot of our well-known people in society who are adulterers by their own admission, by their own confession. Sometimes we wonder, is there any well-known person in America who is not an adulterer? You see, uh, it's so common in our society. See, that's sin. See, and nobody ever preaches a sermon against adultery. It's a sin against God. And that's the first class uh, of people that uh, Paul mentions here in this list of 17. And then he comes to the end of the list, and then he mentions drunkards and revilers. And that's the, 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 at the end of the list. We don't have time to go through all the uh, 17. And so the Bible says drunkards do not go to heaven. Alcoholics do not go to heaven. And then it says, and uh, those that are involved in uh, reveling. You see, uh, the, th the fact here of uh, revelings. Now, say, what are revelings? Very simple. They're drunken parties. That's what they are. They're parties that people go to and everybody gets drunk and they do things they regret and they wake up the next morning and they're ashamed of what they have done. You see, that's revelings. Say, drunken parties where people just go to live it up, uh, drink, and do things they shouldn't do. Now, see, what we're saying, say, that's the indication in the Bible 
that a person is not saved, that they do not know the Lord. Say, God's people don't go out and get drunk and uh, live like the devil and go uh, to uh, these uh, drunken uh, uh, parties. Now, um, now, you see, what Paul is talking about is he's characterizing people that are unsaved. Now, see, uh, there's a lot of alcoholics and drunkards that got saved. Amen? God can save a drunkard. God can save an alcoholic. Many uh, have uh, had serious drinking problems, and they come to Jesus Christ, and he gives them the power to overcome the bottle. Amen? To overcome drinking. See, and he breaks that bondage of sin in their lives. Now, uh, as you turn to the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, the Bible uh, says here, there are eight classes of people who will not go to heaven. Now, see, what we're pointing out are different lists in the Bible. See, people in the Bible that the Bible says they will not go to heaven. See, they will not enter the kingdom of God. See, we began 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Galatians 5, 21, and then in Revelation 21 and verse 8. Here's what it says in Revelation 21 and verse 8. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, those involved in uh, cultic activities, and idolaters, and all liars, all liars, you see, shall have their part in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In other words, the Bible says that these people do not go to heaven, but they will go to hell. And he lists eight types of people here that the Bible says. Now, this is not Pastor Gent. Read your Bible. Get the Bible out. It's Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. See, there are eight classes of people who will definitely wind up in hell because they are not saved. Now, the interesting thing is the first class of people that he mentions are uh, fearful. Now, what do we mean by fearful people? And that's simply the word that means to be afraid. See, they are afraid to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're afraid. What are my friends going to think? What is my husband going to think? What is my wife going to think? What's my boyfriend going to think? What's my girlfriend going to think? Uh, and, and so forth. And how many people have I known personally, and I'm sure you too, uh, also of uh, people who are on the brink of accepting Christ as their Savior but they were afraid of what their friends would say. You see, they were afraid of what their family would say. See, and the Bible says that the first class of people that uh, John is talking about there, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, are people that are spiritual cowards. They're afraid to come to Jesus Christ. And a great example in the Bible of this is Pilate. You remember, Pilate knew that Jesus Christ was innocent. Now, as you study the scripture about Pilate, he did everything he could to set Jesus Christ free. Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus Christ, and yet he was responsible for the crucifixion. Now, the Bible says very clearly, Pilate, willing to content the people had Jesus Christ crucified. Imagine that. See, why did he have him crucified? He wanted to content the people. He was afraid of the people. Maybe he'd lose his job, and he would have uh, if he let Jesus free, and one thing or another. But it says willing to content the people. Rather, uh, he wanted to be a people pleaser, and as a result, he had Jesus Christ crucified. Imagine that. Imagine that. He had Christ. Uh, why? Because he wanted to con uh, content the people. 
I trust there's nobody here this morning. We think about uh, peer pressure. A lot of times with young people, a lot of times with teenagers, a lot of times with college students, but a lot of times with older people, even uh, a senior citizen. See, there's that peer pressure. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to accept Christ as my Savior because of what others will think. Uh, my mother, my father, my, my buddies. See, if I accept Christ and live for him, you see, uh, I would have to pay a price for that. And so they're fearful, they're afraid, and they ne never have the courage to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. And one of the greatest illustrations in the Bible is uh, Pilate. Now, the last thing that uh, John mentions here is uh, in Revelation 21 in verse 8, and he says, and all liars. He doesn't say liars. He said, everybody who is a liar. See, their life is characterized by lying, cheating, whatever. But the, the, here is the word liar. See, they actually lie. They're, they're just addicted to the matter of lying. So we read that here in the Word of God. We might say there, who in our society today is not a liar. Say, who is not a liar? It's so common today, all over, in every aspect, amen? Say, lying, lying, lying. Say, and the Bible teaches that all, not some, but all liars will have their part in the lake of fire, the second death, that's eternal hell. And then in uh, Revelation 22 and verse 15, the Bible says, talking here about uh, the heavenly state, for without, Revelation twenty two fifteen. for without are dogs. Very interesting. No dogs in heaven. And sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever maketh and loveth a lie. So you have that thing lie against there. Now you have uh, six characteristics here. And the first thing he mentions here are dogs. How many dog lovers do we have here this morning? Raise your hand. Be honest. Be honest. You love dogs. You're a dog lover. Okay. This is not talking about dogs. See, uh, so i uh, put you at ease right there. See, the word dogs here is used in two ways in the Bible. Now, number one, in Deuteronomy 23 and verse 18, it talks there about dogs. Now, and in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 18, it's talking, number one, about a, the Bible says, a whore, a woman who is involved uh, continually in sexual sin. And then in Deuteronomy 23, 18, it mentions dogs. Now, dogs there refer to male prostitutes. That's what it means exactly, uh, Deuteronomy 23 and verse 18. Now, uh, that uh, filthy sin of homosexuality and being a male prostitute. Now, it says when these people try to come to worship at the uh, Jewish tabernacle at that particular time, see, the priest was to turn them away. In other words, see, they could not worship God in the Old Testament tabernacle. But in the context, what it's talking about is giving money. In other words, they live in sin and uh, they come to the tabernacle and they give money to the priest to make some type of a vow, you see. And the Bible says that the priest should not accept their money. Uh, bring it up to today's, uh, uh, to today's day and age. See, uh, some people come to church and they think that by giving money, their sins will be forgiven. And somehow they give money, they'll get right with God. See, and that's not it at all. But that's what it could be what dogs are talking about here. He's talking here, if it's correlated with Deuteronomy 23, 18, with male homosexuals, uh, 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 male prostitutes. And then it's used in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 2, the dogs there in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 2, it's talking there about people who believe in work salvation. 
See, the Judaizers who said that you're not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ alone, but you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. See, and those people who believed in work salvation, see, what that's talking about there is uh, dog. See, they're referred to as dog. See, uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse uh, uh, 2. So whether he's talking about those who believed in work salvation or those who were living in perverted sin, uh, you have your choice. He's well, talking about people living in perverted sin or people who teach works sal uh, salvation. But that's how the list begins, the sixth there. And then it ends with whosoever, say, loveth, and the list ends there, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Isn't that interesting? How uh, in uh, two different lists, they conclude the list by saying Whoso that all liars or whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Say, uh, say all habitual liars will go to hell, according to the Bible. That's not Pastor Gent. That's your Bible. Read it. The verses are right there in your Bible uh, uh, to read. Now, what does that tell us? As I mentioned, say, is there anybody today who is not a liar, who does not lie? Are there any college students today? Are there any high school students today? Are there any businessmen or workers today who do not lie? See, it's just part of our society. And um, in certain areas, you almost expect people to lie to you. But you see, lying is a sin against God. Now, see, in all these sins we mentioned, see, Jesus Christ died to save sinners. See, we can all have our sins forgiven. We can have our sins washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ, no matter what we have done. There's no sin in the book. I've heard preachers say, well, homosexuals cannot be saved. Yes, they can, according to the Word of God. And the church at Corinth was made up of some former homosexuals. You read about it there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It talks about murderers. Murderers have been saved. Uh, thank God for the testimony of the Son of Sam. Amen. That track out in the track rack. The Son of Sam. No matter who a person is, no matter what they have done, if they repent of their sin and come to Jesus Christ, they will be saved, according to the Word of God. But then, of course, um, the authority on this is Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22, where you read there about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus himself said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's what Jesus said. He said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, haven't we done this? And haven't we done uh, the, this and that? Say, in your name. And Jesus said, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, and they will not enter. Say, they will not enter. They will not go to heaven. And he concludes that paragraph by saying um, that uh, he never knew them. They were involved in religion. They would say they believe in Jesus. And yet they're never going to go to heaven someday because they never repented of their sin and they never really, truly were saved. Now, that's from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how do we apply that today? How do we apply it to we who are here this morning? You say, oh, pastor, that doesn't apply to me. A lot of times we hear a passage like that preached. And, oh, that's the, the crowd that are outside uh, the church. No, he's talking about those that are inside the church. He's talking about church members. He's talking about uh, people that are inside, not outside. Now, how does that apply to us today? In all probability, there are some people here this morning right here today, right now, and if you died, Jesus will, would say to you, 
I never knew you. You never repented of your sin. You never really trusted him as your savior. You never came to the cross to be forgiven of your sin. You had religion. You had good works. You had good thoughts. You had good intentions. But you never knew Jesus Christ. And in all probability, there is somebody like that here this morning. That if you would die and go out into eternity, you would find out that you never really knew the Lord. You had religion. You had the church. But you were not saved. He's talking about those inside, not outside. Say, many, and he said, not a few. But he says, many, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. You say, and Jesus will say, I will say unto them, I never knew you. They shall not enter the kingdom. That's why everybody here this morning, you need to pay attention, wake up. Are you really saved? Say, I'm not asking, do you come to church? Have you made a profession of faith? Have you been baptized? But are you saved? Why? Because if you're not saved, you're going to go to hell, according to the Bible. Now, we're talking about heaven, but you see, heaven is a restricted place. We pointed out all these verses in the Bible of people who do not go to heaven. You see, it's a restricted place. And even Jesus said, a lot of people say, you're, uh, I'm your follower. But you see, they're not saved. They don't know the Lord. And Jesus said, he doesn't say that you lost your salvation or I forgot about you, or you forgot about me. See, he said, I never knew you. That's a double negative. Never under any circumstances were you ever saved. That's why everybody needs to wake up and say, am I saved? Say, if I died today, would I go to heaven? Say, this is not for those outside the church. It's for those inside the church. And they're the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, uh, who does go to heaven. Now, we pointed out many verses in the Bible that are very clear about who do not go to heaven, even the words of Jesus himself. But now, say we have that wonderful illustration in the Bible of the dying criminal who died next to Jesus Christ. And there's a great illustration in the Bible of someone who lived a very wicked life he lived a very ungodly life. And as you read the Gospels, you find that just uh, moments before this, he was cursing Jesus Christ out with the other thief. He was cursing Jesus Christ. Now, we find there in the Word of God, in Luke chapter 23, and verses 42 and 43, that he repented. He realized he was a sinner. And he said, I realize I don't deserve uh, 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 or I do deserve being uh, crucified. Now, that's really something. Say, I deserve it. I owe it. I, I, he must have murdered maybe several people. I don't know. But uh, he said he deserved to be crucified. He knew he was a sinner. He's convicted by the Holy Spirit. And he turned to Jesus. Now, now by the way, this totally eliminates all teaching about purgatory. There is no purgatory. If anybody deserved to go to purgatory, it was this man. He never had any good works in his life at all. And so now he calls out upon the Lord, and he simply said, Lord, remember me. Now, in Luke chapter 23, verses 42 and 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Say, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Say, with me. You have that little phrase again. Say, that's heaven, with me. Now, a lot of people are way off and they're teaching about uh, paradise. Say, uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 4, paradise is the third heaven. Paradise is the eternal dwelling place of God, the heaven of heavens, according to 2 Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And then in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, you see, um, uh, paradise is a synonym for heaven. Revelation 2 and verse 7. So what Jesus is saying here uh, to this man, say, today 
you're going to be with me in heaven. Say, can I know I'm going to heaven? Yes, we can know it if we know Jesus Christ. He said, this day, today, thou shalt be, see in the key here, with me, with me in heaven. They're both going to die in a very short period of time. Uh, why? See, he realized he was a sinner who did not deserve to go to heaven, and he trusted, he repented of his sin, he trusted Christ as his Savior. And that's why the Bible says he went to heaven. And there's a great illustration in the Bible of someone that went to heaven. And uh, he's never baptized, he never tried to do good, uh, anything like that, never had any good works, but he was saved by the grace of God. He was saved by the mercy of God because he repented and turned to the Lord. Now, the wonderful thing is all of us can have that same assurance to be with Jesus when we die. Say, you say, well, pastor, what must I do to be saved? The Bible talks about repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to repent of our sins and trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now, the Bible teaches that we need to be saved today. Because the Bible says we may not have a tomorrow. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto men once to die. After this, the judgment. Nobody gets saved after they die. There's no second chance in the Bible. There's no coming back and crying and, and weeping and say, Oh, God, help me to go back to get saved. No, when you, get, when you die, it's appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the Bible says the judgment. And uh, there's no going back. There's no second uh, uh, chance. And we need to get it settled today, right now. College students, young people, teenagers, senior citizens, no matter who you are, you need to get it settled today. You need to get it settled right now. That's why God has enabled you to be in the service uh, this morning. How many know the young 19-year-old boy by the name of Keith Pinto? Anybody know Keith Pinto? Well, Keith Pinto was the lifeguard down there at Seaside Heights Beach. And about just a few days before uh, Labor Day, a few weeks ago, and here's the uh, newspaper article, services set for shore lifeguard hit by lightning. Very interesting because he was a lifeguard there and uh, he was killed by the lightning and seven others were injured around the lifeguard stand. Now, now I thought that all the lifeguard stands, uh, uh, people know about boats and nautical things, you can buy a little device, just $25, and it'll uh, warn you if there's lightning anywhere around you. It'll start beeping, and it'll tell you exactly where the lightning is, and, and uh, you should go to safety. And I'm sure every lifeguard stand had that lightning warning device. If they don't, they should, and I'm sure they did. But now, uh, he was struck by lightning. By the way, he was the second lifeguard that was killed in the Jersey Shore this summer. The second lifeguard. But uh, now, he was there at Seaside Heights Beach. He's the lifeguard. And they say the lightning came. It killed him, struck him, and killed him. And seven others were injured. Now, we're talking about how, uh, how life is so unpredictable, how we're here today and gone tomorrow. Now, you know what they said about that, that lightning strike? They said that it came out of nowhere. In other words, nobody expected it. Evidently, it wasn't on the uh, uh, lightning warning devices. He was just there and seven other people around him, and it struck him and it killed him. Why? And they said it came out of nowhere. They had no warning. People have been on the beach at different times and things like that, and there's a warning, get off the beach, there's lightning coming, there's a, a thunderstorm coming, get off the beach. But this they said, now, this is amazing. Here's a young 19-year-old lifeguard, and he's been around the water, involved in being a lifeguard since he's 16 years old, and uh, uh, they said the lightning came out of nowhere and struck him. 
and killed him. And he was, he died instantaneously. This is Seaside Heights Beach a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this was the thing. They said it came out of nowhere. Struck him and killed him. Now, the thing about it, we never know when death is going to come. Today is a day of salvation. As someone has said, it's not today, but now is the day of salvation. Say, right now is always a day of salvation. Now, here's a young 19-year-old boy, lifeguard, uh, and so forth, and they say, it came out of nowhere. No warning at all. There was no warning for that lightning, and it struck him and killed him. Well, say, are you saved? If you're not saved, you need to be saved. And you need to be saved today, and you need to be saved right now. Luke chapter 10 and verse 20 says, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Thank God all saved people, everybody who has repented of their sins and trusted Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross to save them, forgive them of their sins, say the Bible says their names are written in heaven. Nobody will get to heaven unless your name is written in heaven. But see, when you get saved, when you come to Christ, when you receive him as your Savior, praise God, your name is written in heaven. And it always reminds me of a funeral I had years ago, way back in a small mountain town. And they said, uh, uh, Brother Gent, would you come and preach the funeral? And it was way out in a community where just hundreds, uh, a hundred or so people would live. I mean, it was way, way out. And uh, I remember at that funeral, and that, that woman, her name was Mary, and she was saved. She knew Jesus Christ as her Savior. She was born again. Everybody knew she was born again. Everybody knew she loved the Lord and was saved. And I remember in that funeral, I said, now, you know, hardly anybody knows the name of Mary. Here we're gathered together for her funeral. But I said, praise God, Mary's name is written in heaven because she knew Jesus Christ as her Savior. See, Luke chapter 10 and verse 20, Jesus says, don't rejoice over all these wonderful things you're doing. The thing you really need to rejoice in, Jesus said, is that your name is written in heaven. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. As our heads are bowed and as our eyes are uh, closed, uh, is there someone this morning, how many this morning would say, Pastor, I don't believe my name is written in heaven, but I want to get it written down in heaven. I want to know I'm going to heaven when I die. Pastor, I want to be saved. I want to get it settled. You'd say, Pastor, that's me. My hand. Would you pray for me? I'm not saved. I'm not sure I'm saved. But, Pastor, I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I can't say I know my sins have been forgiven, but I want to know that. I want to come to Christ. Yes, Pastor, I know I am a sinner. I am a sinner.